covering is logic functions and circuits, so chapters 2.1 to 2.2. But before then, a couple of announcements. Number one, there is no lab this week. We're going to start our first lab uh, next week. But let me pause because we just have a new student come in and you're not on the list. So this was only for like a second, although in real time it was more than that. So anyway, okay. So there is no lab this week. So don't show up tomorrow, but next week there is lab. Uh, that's an obvious point. But what I decided to do was I decided to give you like extra credit just for the heck of it. So I'll, every week I'll assign an extra credit on Monday. So I posted this day before yesterday, like night, whatever. Uh, there. So you're going to earn 1% extra credit per problem. There is no partial credit because I don't want to end up like grading. It's for fun, right? So if you get everything right, you'll get like an extra 10% credit. So this is the first problem. It's due by Monday, uh, the start of lecture. Okay, so either turn it into me via email. You can email me a solution or you can give it to me in class. But what I expect you to do is I would expect you to solve this like systematically, right? That is, don't guess. Uh, like, in this case, it's pretty hard to guess. But just solve it like you would solve any other problem. So, yeah, that's... And I'll, I already thought about the next three or four extra credits. So I'll post that on Mondays. We'll go from there. All right. So, before we get started, so today, this is 2900. Important lecture 2. Do you have any questions? So, this is chapter... 2.1 to 2.2. Any questions at all? If not, recall that this is where we were at. That is, so basically, if we had some, I don't know, uh, 13, not 13, 1, 3 in hex, the way you would convert this to decimal is the concept is the what was the concept what was the numbering scheme called do you remember yeah it's the positional numbering system so in other words if you know the base you can write this as 1 times 16 plus 3 times all 16 to the 0 16 to the 1 so 16 plus 3 this is 19 in decimal so 1 3 hex is 19 decimal get it so where we stop so today where we'll start is number, the first thing is, suppose I've given you a number in base 10, 254, and I want to convert this. Let's stick to our friend hexadecimal. So recall that the hex digits, any hex digit is a member of this set, 0, 1, 2. You're familiar with set notation? What does this mean? You've seen this before? No, it's not sum. Yeah, includes. So sum is sigma. Okay, that's this. So what is this Greek letter? Epsilon. All right, and that's my beautiful. Well, let me try to draw epsilon properly. I'll try. Ah, there, that's better. Okay. You can see I don't get to do this often. But anyway, so basically you can have digits. Well, not. It's not digit. Okay, digit is for decimal, so a hex digit, if you will, 0 through f. Now, the question is, how do you go from here to here? Right. Because we're able to go from an unknown base to base 10 because we knew the base. right? So that's, sorry, we knew, not the base, we knew the digits in that base. In this case, we don't know that. So how would you do this? So in other words, is equal to some you don't even know, so if you want uh, sigma, since somebody mentioned sum, some k going from, I don't know, 0 to n, d sub k, 16 to the k, right? So this is dn, 16 to the n, plus dn minus 1, 16 to the n minus 1. I'm just writing this out in general. Right? It's just uh, d0, 16 to the 0. The problem is we don't know the D's. We have to find it. So how would we find it? So first of all, let me tell you for simplicity, because I want to come up, the goal is I want to come up with a general algorithm to do this. 
And you're going to see, or what you should see, is that algorithm is kind of like the inverse operation of this. Because it has to be, right? Because if you're going from base 16 to, ba if you're going from a one base to base 10, to go from base 10 to the other base, you have to perform the inverse of what we're doing here. Correct? Make sense? So I'll tell you for now that this will only involve, well, I mean, I mean, let's put in three digits. Let's say you didn't know how much it, um, so I said three, I'm putting in four. Let's do this. Okay. I mean, if you think about it, uh, 254 is probably not going to be represented by more than three digits. It's You don't need three, three hex digits. Okay, sorry. All right. So given these, we were able to go here. Yes? So how do I go backwards? How do I find? So this implies what? So I'm, I have to find D0, D1, D2. So the goal is find D0, D1, and D2. How do I do that? Uh, e, so yes, so how? How? Correct. So, so the suggestion was, you see how many times 16 squared, for example, goes into 254. What operation is that? What mathematical operation is that? Division, right? So what we're going to do, so here's the algorithm. I'll just, since you guys figured it out pretty much, I'll just tell you what the algorithm is. So we're going to do division and remainder, right? So the first thing we're going to do is step one, if you will. So take, let's call this equation one. Let's find out. So instead of doing, the solution was let's use 256. You could do that. I'm going to do it like, this is not a standard way. Well, it is standard in the sense is what most people do. That is, they don't they don't divide by the largest uh, weight here. They divide by the base itself. Okay, and the reason why they do that do that is you really don't know what the largest weight is going to be. Correct. So you take equation one. That is the right hand side of equation one. Well, it's not the right hand side. Let's take equation one. This entire thing, and divide by find the remainder actually when the equation is divided by 16, okay? So note that rem is remainder. And I'm using rem uh, because one of the VHDL keywords is for remainder is rem, but it's also mathematically. Do you know what the symbol is for finding the remainder? In mathematics, quotient is what the slash. Okay, percent. it's the percent actually. Okay, so in other words, what happens? Therefore, I take two fifty four. Correct. So I'll use percent from now. D two sixteen squared plus D one sixteen, D zero sixteen to the zero. What is the remainder? So I'll tell you that. The remainder operator is distributive. Okay, that is, you can take this just like multiplication. You can distribute it. Okay, so what is the remainder once I distribute it? So be careful. There's not the quotient. Okay. Well, sixteen to the zero is one. So this is going to be percent sixteen. So what is the expression on the right hand side. Come on, should be quick. Time you guys. Ding 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 ding. What's okay? Let's look at this expression, step by step. 
What's the remainder when 16 squared times something is divided by 16? This is not the quotient. Remainder, not the quotient. Is 16 squared divisible by 16? Zero. What? Zero. Correct? Because 16 squared is divisible by 16, right? What about this fellow? What about this guy? What's the remainder when 2 is divided by 3? 2, right? Correct? So what's the remainder when D0 is divided by 16? Remainder, not the quotient. Okay? It's D0, right? Correct? We're not, so okay, so I guess you're getting confused because we're not looking at, uh, we're looking at integer division, right? These are all, uh, I don't want to say integers, they're hex integers, if you will. Okay. okay, so let's see. So we're done, so that's good, right? On the right hand side, we have D0. So what about on the left hand side? Well, let's divide. 254 by 16, what do we get? It's not 16 for sure, because 16 times 16 is 256. So let's try 16 times 15. What is that? So you have to subtract, yeah, 240. Correct? Now, you got to be really careful with this, because what do you have on the right-hand side? You have D0, correct? D0 is a hex digit, yes? So what is this actually? Is it D? E. Okay, so here it is. It's 14, but E, yes? That's great. So we got the first hex digit. Awesome, okay. Well, let's not box this. Let's box the final answer. So is this clear? So the trick here is we apply the remainder operator, yeah, remainder operation, if you will. Since uh, these two numbers are divisible by 16, the remainder is 0. This one is not. We got D0, correct? So we got D0 as E because we applied, when we applied the remainder operation on the right-hand side of this equation, we applied the same operation to the left-hand side of this equation. We got this. All right. That's great. Now, I want to extract, let's say, D1. So what do I do? So this is step one, okay? The step two of this algorithm is I'm going to take equation one and divide it by 16. Well, let's find the quotient. And let's see what this will give us. So let's do the same. Therefore, I had 254. So what we'll do is I'll tell you the general algorithm. We'll drive it step by step, and then we'll do a lot of examples. In the sense, you don't have to do this like every time. You can there's a shortcut to this, but you have to understand where this comes from. Okay. Now, based on what we just did here, okay, what is so again you can distribute this out. D0 divided by 16. So let's start term by term. Based on what it is here, again, we're doing integer division. What is the quotient when D0 is divided by 16? What's the quotient? D0 is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way through F. What? 0. This is going to drop out. Okay? Now, there's no magic. It's math. What's the quotient? Not the remainder. The quotient when D1 times 16 is divided by 16. D1, you can just cancel this, right? It's uh, the quotient operation. Ah, look at this. And this is 16. Viola, right? That's great. So what you can do, and what is the quotient on the left-hand side 
when 254 is divided by 16. Sorry? The quotient. 1, 5. All right? Now, you got to be careful about the base again in the sense what base in, on the right hand side you have base 10. Yes? Correct? So on this should not be written in hex. Is that clear? Huh, but you're almost done, right? In this case, we're almost done. Step three is, if you will, uh, repeat step one till you get some dk equals zero. That is, now you want d1, right? So you find the remainder when this guy is divided by 16. So you do this, well, when this entire fellow is divided by 16. Okay? So when you divide the right-hand side by 16, you're going to get D1 is going to pop out, right? What happens to the left-hand side? What is 15 divided by 16? So here you have D1. So tell me in hex, what is it? F. Correct? Then you will see that when you try to divide this by 16, correct? Well, let me be more specific. It's not DK till, sorry about this. Left hand side is zero. Okay? The thing is, when you divide this entire thing by 16, you're going to get D2 on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, what is the quotient when 15 is divided by 16? The quotient, zero. D2 is zero. You don't need D2. Okay? You're going to keep getting zeros after that. You can stop. Therefore, 254 in base 10 is F E 16. Okay. So this is actually the proof of how you do this. To recap, this is the inverse operation for converting from any base to base 10. For converting from any base to base 10, we simply use the positional numbering system. To convert from base 10 to any base, you have to do this division, uh, that is quotient remainder or remainder quotient thing. And this seems more difficult because you're probably not used to this whole remainder quotient. But it's not. So let's look at a mnemonic to do this. All right. So here's a mnemonic. Yeah, there are many mnemonics. This is the mnemonic I use. So let's look at an example. Let's say I ask you, let's, with an example, convert 101 ha, base 10 to base 2. Okay? You actually don't want to do this in the sense you don't want to write it out, divide by two. It's going to be it's a lot of work, right? So let's try to come up with a mnemonic in the sense here's my number to be converted, base 10, okay? What number do I divide this by? So what number did we divide by, I mean divide and remainder? What did we use here? 16. 2, right? So to the base I want to convert to. So here is the base. I write out the remainder here. Okay? Now based on we, what we just discussed, what is the first bit? Now we can use that because we're converting to base 2. It pops out. Is it the B0 bit or BN bit? What pops out first? So when I do... B0, is that clear? The most common mistake which students make is they think this is BN, but you know because of this proof why, right? The first thing that pops out is the least, so let me start using the terminology. This is the least significant, in our case, bit, abbreviated L, S, little b, okay? But as L is capital B, it's like least significant byte. That is, what do you think is the least significant byte? Tom, de describe it to me another way. What's a byte? Eight bits. So what is the least significant byte? What? B0 through B7, right? So that's the least significant byte. 
and where you will use all this is have you heard of little indian and big indian anywhere no okay so i'll tell you that later but um, you we will encounter encounter this later in the course but let's say you have 16 bits right you might have actually read this in technical articles oh yeah let's look at the least significant byte that means the that means b0 to b7 if you have 32 bits they might say let's look at the least significant word or the most significant word so for binary or base 2 bits i mean this least significant stuff it's so important it's extended to like groupings of bits they don't say least significant nibble interestingly but anyway so this is b0 yes very clear this is a common mistake students make they think this is the most significant but it's not it's because of this simple proof we just did all right now you know why you need this mnemonic so what's the quotient when so you write the quotient here you write the remainder here so what's the quotient 50 what's the remainder can you tell me when will the remainder be zero what property should this number satisfy when dividing by 2 should be even right with 2 it's very quick right but now you can see how many divisions you have to do right because it's a smaller base compared to base 10 so you have more bits all right so finish this up i'm going to pass the lecture i want to do this here so don't look oh uh, there's a question which popped up so before i answer the question let's just look at this so it's just division right write the quotient here remainder here remember this is the least significant whatever bit digit okay go all the way here once you reach zero quotient just like here on the left hand side if you reach zero for d2 correct and there's no point in dividing further right you're going to get zeros so zero divided by 2 quotient is zero remainder is zero it's all zeros right you stop so this is called as the msb most significant bit and notice how i wrote this i wrote so well, let me rewrite it for the recording so i started with the least significant bit 1 0 1 Zero, you see that, right? One, z. Oops. One, zero, one, zero. Correct. Four bits. A little gap. Zero, one, one, zero. Base two. Big equals. That's a good idea to group bits this way because if you just write it as like one bit string, it's hard to see. So groupings of four bits are common when you have a byte or a word. When you have a um, double word or a quad word, quad word is 64 bits. Okay, they you can group it in groups of eight bits, right? So you should get into this habit of uh, develop this habit of writing a binary number like that. Question? Yeah. it's easier to see that's why so the question is why am i grouping the bits because it's easier to see so any other questions okay let's do something more challenging convert i don't know let's do an example so there is example i guess 3 what is 334 base 5 base 16 Again, you should be very comfortable with this because as you will get into digital design more, you'll go from base two, base sixteen, base eight. Okay. You gain quickness when you do stuff like this, right? And uh, the suggested problems are more practice. If you want even more practice, stop by my office and I'll give you like more problems. Or you can make up problems on your own. Right? Again, anybody tried Wolfram Alpha? Total aside, I told you it can go between arbitrary bases, right? You can actually ask it for practice problems. You're all familiar with Wolfram Alpha. Or no? How many of you don't know Wolfram Alpha? Okay, so Wolfram Alpha. Let's just look at it. It's a knowledge computation engine. Actually, if you have an iPhone and if you have Siri, you can ask Siri like integrate x squared, and it'll actually, with respect to it, it'll actually do it. It'll it go if it understands what you're saying correctly. It actually goes to Wolfram Alpha. So Wolfram Alpha is a knowledge computation engine. So Wolfram. Alpha. Did I misspell something? Because it's not picking it up, and it should. Yeah, you can ask it something like, I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't know the syntax in Wolfram Alpha for converting bases. So let's let's just ask it. Uh, let me.
me rip out my keyboard. Actually, let's see how smart it is. Okay. First, let's do a standard one. See, this is what I meant. Well, my keyboard is starting to starting up. Practice math problems and more online, so you can get math problems right from from Alpha. Let's see what it is. Hello, keyboard. Are you awake? Yeah, you're awake. Good. Bluetooth is not that slow. Plot sign X. Yeah, I'll just ask. Just ask it. So we know what we're dealing with. So Wolfram Alpha is different from Google. You see that, right? Wolfram Alpha is a knowledge. Oh, plot. Wolfram Alpha doesn't know what it is. Let's try that. Syntax. I don't know math. Oh, so slow. Yeah, interpretation. There it is. Okay. So you see it's different from Google, right? It's a knowledge computation engine. So let's ask it our problem. Let's see how smart it is. Convert 334 from base 5 to base. This is a tall order, right? I'll be surprised if it can do this. Because think about it, it's like natural language parsing. It has to figure out, like, I won't say, oh, so you see what it did? It interpreted this hyphen as base negative five. So that's a valid. Like, let's look at that's that's valid, right? For space. Let's see if it does it, and let's check if it's correct <laughs> because we're going to do it. So this is Wolfram Alpha, right? Very powerful. Holy God, that's pretty impressive, man. Salute you, right? And I did this before lecture. Guess what? That's right. Okay. It also gives you other bases. Very, very powerful, right? How many of you have seen the movie Terminator 2? You know what an Easter egg is? I used to... I... I attended a research conference with Wolfram. I've met Stephen Wolfram. So, oh, they took out this Easter egg. Oh, because they, this was an Easter egg. It says, no, I'm not Skynet. Uh, unlike Skynet, I'm pretty friendly, blah, blah, blah. Damn it. Oh, no, it is. There it is. No, Skynet became self-aware, blah, blah, blah. Pretty cool. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, right. That do not involve. <laughs> yeah, but... Getting back, I'm glad you guys are having fun. See, digital systems can be fun. So let's hopefully let's see if it cached it. Yeah, it did cache it. So that's right. Okay, you can check it. But now, how do we do it? You're not allowed Wolfram Alpha. Oops, I went too far. If you have noticed your, if you have read through your syllabus, there are no electronic devices allowed for this reason, right? If you know how to use it, you can. But this is not too bad, right? So this is an example of a problem I could ask on the exam. So how would you do this? You don't have Wolfram Alpha. Yeah, that's and then base ten to base sixteen. There is no other way that I know of. Okay. So and if you can find, tell me a better way, well, it's awesome. Right? I would like to know. Solution is convert three thirty four to base ten and convert base ten to base sixteen. Okay. So whoops, it's not sixteen. We can't convert that to sixteen. So one, how do you convert 334 to base 10? That's, I mean, it's in base five. We know that, right? So how would you do this? So what is, how would you convert a number from any base to base 10? You use the positional numbering system, yes? So let's just, you know the base and you know the digits. So this is, ah, so this is five to the zero, five to the one, five squared. And you can see, since you're not allowed any calculator or something, I won't give you large numbers, right? With base two, is not too bad, right? But with the other bases, I mean, five cubed is 125. If you know that, that's great. Uh, four times five to the zero. Okay, so what's this? So this is 25. Sorry, question? You have a question or? Oh, that's Wolfram Alpha says 5e. 
We got, you got, we got that. Great. That's correct, actually. 75 plus 15 plus 4. Make sure I don't screw up the multiplication or anything. So that's 94. And this is base 10. Yes? Now convert this to base 16. So for this, therefore, 2 oops, implies 94 divided by 16. I know 16 sixes or 96, so this is the quotient is 5, okay? The remainder, again, if you want, this is the LS, I don't know, hex digit. There's no shortcut for hex digit, is there? Is that a hexit? It's not hit, doesn't make sense, right? So, okay. so what's the, um, so 16 times 5 is 80. Again, it's all this 14 keeps popping up, but what's 14 in hex? Right, and then 16, ah, 0, 5. Therefore, the final answer, 334 in base 5, is 5e in base 16. And that's exactly what we, well, from Alpha says. I'll leave this up. It's pretty useful. <laughs> okay? You can see it's got, like, a lot more interpretations. <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> double precision, IEEE. So, yeah, it's very useful. Go through it. Okay, let's do another quick example, right, in the sense. Any questions so far? All right, so example four. What is FF, FF, base 16 to base 10? How would you do this? Like, how would you do this systematically? How would you convert that to base 10? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, you're jumping ahead. That's right. But systematically, how would you do it? You take F times 16, how much? 0, 1, 16 cubed plus F times 16 squared. That's how you do this, right? And the weighting, the decimal weighting for F, whatever. So that's how you do it. That's, what's your name? Sorry. For us, so let's go for us idea. How he says something about split. So how would you do this really quickly? Can you do this really quickly? Yeah. yeah. But more specifically, Robert, yeah. So the claim is this is sixteen to the fifth minus one. Proof. Exactly. Uh, that's what both these guys said. And Faraz's, I'll go back on Faraz's idea. That's also correct. So if you have FFFF plus 1, this is 16 to the 5th, right? But is that clear? You take this number and you add 1, you get 16 to the 5th. It's like saying, so the equivalent, I want you to prove this because it's like saying if I take F and I add 1, what do I get? 1, 0 in decimal? 16, correct? And the, you'll see why this trick is useful in a sense. Let's keep going. So this implies FF, FF is 16 to the 5th minus 1. So it will be 16, base 10. How's that? Okay. So now, can I, how do I compute 16 to the fifth? That goes back to Faraz's idea. Easily, without a calculator. You can, believe me. No, without, yeah, but can I simplify 16? Yes. So this is 2 to the fourth to the fifth minus one, okay? And you can say, wait, two to the 20th minus one. Mm. Wait a minute, this doesn't look right. Is this 16 to the fifth? 
One, two, three, four. Ah! Off by one error. Correct? So, it's good we made this mistake. So, this is... Sorry, I should have checked that. But 16 to the 4. Let's be careful, right? So, this is 0. This is 1. This is 2. The position, if you will. Okay. Let me use the terminology we used yesterday. The place value is 16 to the 0, 16 to the 1, 16 squared, 16 cubed. So after this is 16 to the 4th, so 16 to the 4th, 16 to the 4th, there you go. 2 to the 4th to the 4th, 2 to the 16th. Okay, does anyone know what 2 to the 16th is? Okay, so... 65,536. So the reason why I'm doing this example is these quantities, like 2 to the 16th minus 1, this is 65,536 minus 1. So this is 65,535 base 10. These quantities, 2 to the 16th, 2 to the 8th. So what is 2 to the 8th? 256. 2 to the 10th is what? 1024. So all these quantities are quantities you should start remembering as digital designers, right? Not for like today's lecture, but eventually. So you can say like, how many bits is a kilobyte? Uh, careful, that's the thing, right? A kilo. So a kilo in binary is 1024, right? So a kilobyte is 1024 bytes, correct? A byte is 8 bits. So it's 1024 times 8. Is that clear? So it's all these little... Uh, so here, let me write this down. So the purpose... So the goal is... Remember... Ah, I think my marker's... Pin's dying. Remember... Powers of 2. So let's see, for example, 2 to the 8 is equal to 256, 2 to the 10th is 1024, 2 to the 12th is what? 4096, correct? 2 to the 11th is 2048, it's 4096 is standard. 2 to the 16th is, some people even remember 2 to the 32, right? It's 47 something, 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 I don't remember. 536, okay? Now, let's look at something else. Let's, since we are on this example, let's beat it to death and let's go back to what Firaz said. What is FFFF in binary? All ones, okay? It's because how many bits you need to represent one hex digit? How many bits? Four, right? So what you do is you start from the least significant, you start grouping them. One, 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 one. Now you will see why you want to group them. One, 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 one. 1, 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, 1, 2. Correct? So let's say I give you a classic example uh, they ask on an exam is coffee. C, 0, F, F, E, E. Stop it all. Okay, stupid example, right? So, <laughs> but anyway. So again, please practice this, right? You can ask, you can ask Wolfram Alpha, go between different bases. The more comfortable you are with this, the quick, the more quickly you become comfortable with this, the easier your um, VHD and all will become. Because right? you don't want to spend time thinking about this. All right, now we are we have only eight minutes. That's fine. Since we can start chapter two, we'll continue next lecture. So introduction to logic circuits. So let me do this. I'll just give you, since we have only eight minutes. I think we have only eight minutes. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll give you like the, the concept behind why Boolean logic became very popular. Right? So to understand digital logic, we must, it's very important, understand the concept of a Boolean 
So in this case, I'm not going to use true or false. Okay. Again, that's what George Boole used. He's a logician. Let's use what Cloud Shannon did. That is assign true to be a one, on to be a one, false to be a zero, or off to be a zero. Again, you don't have to assign true to one, false to zero. You can assign true to zero, false to one. Right? Remember that. So it's one zero function. So in other words, this has two words, Boolean and function, right? Boolean, I just described what it is. It's one or zero. That's the entire set. What's a function? Because this will hopefully help, uh, this should help you understand how, why this is so powerful, right? This digital logic. So a question, what is a function? So you don't have to give me the exact mathematical definition. And if you can, great. But what, what's a function? So there is a relation between two sets. But give me an... So all functions are relations, but not all relations are functions, right? So give me an example of something that's not a function. So let's start visually. So let me, okay, let me start. X, Y. Is this a function? So what function do you think this is? Yeah, X squared. Y equals X squared. Okay. So give me an example of something that's not a function. Circle. Something less esoteric. Aha, x equals y squared. I like that. What does this look like? Correct? Why is this not a function? It fails the it fails the vertical line test. So this is not a function of x because it fails what you call the vertical line test. So based on this vertical line test, can you give me a definition of a function? That is if you hit a plot a vertical line, right? You get two values. For what? I mean, this vertical line test should directly lead you to the definition of a function. It's very important to what we're going to do. Yeah. So in other words, a function, so here's the definition. A function is a relation that assigns one only, it's actually one and only, but I'll just write only one value in the core domain for every value in the domain. So in other words, this is how we write a function. This is the domain. And this is the core domain. So for every value in here, there is only one value here. Okay? That's not true here. For a for every value here, how many values are there in the core domain? There are two, right? Not a function. But the other way will work. That is, for every value here, I can have two values here. They're like, yeah, so what? Who cares? It's calculus, right? Well, guess what? The issue with this is how many how many points there are in the domain here? How many points are there? Oh, this thing keeps extending, huh? Infinite, right? But that that's the crux of digital logic. There aren't an infinite set of values in the domain. There is one, zero, or if you have a two-input logic function, you have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. You have only finite number of elements in the domain. That's what, that's the essence of why this became so powerful, right? In Boolean or in Boolean functions, we have only finite number of elements 
in the domain for what we are doing okay this is yeah mathematically you can extend it to like having infinite elements in the domain but we're not concerned with all that we are dealing with finite we are designing digital systems which have finite uh, bandwidth if you will right so let's look at so let's start with and this is where we'll end the lecture single input boolean functions that is i have input x correct x can be 0 or 1 yes how many different kind of functions can i have what four okay what are the four so let me label it y0 good guess right 2 3 don't look the point is it's okay if you get it wrong it's not okay if you get it wrong every time because you don't understand what's going on right that's the point okay so what are there was an answer 2 there was an answer 4 so robert said four so let's put him on the <laughs> what are the four okay let's let's stop robert right there is this a function does this satisfy our definition that's my question it does right you have only one value for every value in the domain right is that clear so what's the other one so let's keep going let's say one one there's no particular order to this what are the other two 0 1 1 0 1, 0. you see something what do you think out of all these four functions correct what 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 jumps out How do I implement y2? So zero goes to zero, one goes to one. Physically, how do I implement it? Yeah, wire. Just take a wire, right? So what? what what's this? This is not interesting. This is grounded. This is always power. Okay. What about this guy? What kind of? What? What is this function? We discussed this. Remember, what is this? It's an inverter, right? This is our NOT gate because it's useful. right in the sense of engineering so let me end this lecture by this note that i can have a uh, multiple input not gates okay so let me just write that out so people don't get confused like wait can not be an input function of only one bit no right i can have so this is the symbol for a not gate this is what we'll continue next time sometimes people draw this very thick okay and they say this is like n So I can have like an 8-bit NOT gate. So you pass in all zeros, you get all ones. Okay? You pass in one zero, one zero, one zero. It'll just complement each line. Okay? But that's a that's a different idea as opposed to this. Is this clear? So if you have a single input, how many possible functions you can have? Four. So this is where I'll end the lecture, and I'm already out of time. But I'm excited. So <laughs> the next one. is two inputs right so how many possible functions can i have oh you guys are yeah that's right 16 yeah so it's 2 to the 2 to the n so you can be like wait i unlike the functions on reals i have only a finite number of elements in the domain it doesn't matter the number of functions grows exponentially Like, well, exponentially to the exponential it goes two to the two to the n, grows really fast. Okay. So, what we will do on Fridays, we'll continue from here. We'll define some quote-unquote useful two-input logic functions, and, or, exclusive or, and actually that's all we'll need, right? So the entire, all the computers you see, <laughs> they work on not, and, or, and exclusive or. But exclusive or can be written in terms of and, ors, and nots. So it's basically and, ors, and nots. I'm not kidding. Like all this, everything. Right? What we don't discuss in this class is feedback, which leads to memory. So hopefully this is all exciting and stuff. And yeah, so I'll see you Friday. It's exciting for me. If it's not exciting for you, let me know. <laughs>